Uh, over the past 30 years, uh, my dad has kind of been an expert in the industry. He's done over 1,000 federal contracts. The government owns and maintains over 900,000 buildings across the United States. They all need maintenance, services. Uh, we're the guys that teach contractors of any type how to get those federal contracts in every market across the United States. One of our clients recently got a MAC contract, $14 million, and he's already got some other solicitations open, uh, David Snodgrass. I wanted to show this little video, but apparently it skipped over. Uh, but this is kind of what the opportunity is with the federal government. In terms of contracts for government buildings, there is no shortage of opportunity. Currently, the U.S. federal government has over 900,000 property assets spread over 3 billion square feet and 41 million acres of land. Like the empty VA hospital in Los Angeles for 5 billion, or parts of this waterfront former military base in San Francisco. Some more examples include the numerous VA hospitals, or for instance, the Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas, which by itself hosts about 54 government buildings. Now we can agree that over 900,000 property assets is plenty of opportunity by maintenance alone, also consider government response to restoring damage from natural disasters, which can take place in contracts as well. So if you're interested in contracting maintenance or restoration or construction in general, and Uncle Sam is not one of your customers, you're missing out on a valuable reason. So what I have here is kind of a, a quarterly report that we turned into our bonding company. And federal government contracts, you have something called payment and performance protection. Uh, but anyway, we provide this report, and what I like about this is it's a snapshot in time of what our company was doing, how many jobs we were doing, where they were at. I think you got about four and a half million dollars worth of work there. We've got, I think, about a million dollars worth of profit. But what happened was we were thinking about uh, years and years and years ago about time and, and what's the best use of our time. And we started thinking about companies that run employees and, and have... Uh, high overheads and they're going out there and doing their work and then we just took like one industry and it just happened to be roofing and we're thinking like you know what did a roofer look like a hundred years ago and, you know in my mind he was a big guy he could probably hit a nail in with one swing or maybe he'd rub it through the oil in his hair and knock it in but, and, and, uh, and so how could a little guy compete with a big guy like that a hundred years ago and then ultimately over time there was some big innovation in the roofing industry you know, and now when you go out to a, a roofing site, you see a whole bunch of, uh, you know, small guys running around and uh, running the nail guns in. And uh, so we thought, well, okay, let's innovate in the industry because that's how we can really compete. And so we got really, really good at the process of performing federal contracts. So good that over, over the history of uh, what we did, we did about a thousand federal contracts. And on that concept of time, we were thinking um, that we would just create an assembly line. Doug would go bid the jobs, I'd perform the jobs. So why we do what we do? And about 10 years ago, my brother was in a boating accident, and he had a golf ball sized portion of his brain removed. And uh, we spent the next five years, we left the construction business and focused on his recovery. And at the end of five years, we were sitting around talking about, you know, kind of what we should do next. And my dad got this, what I call the entrepreneurial brain fart and said, we're going to teach contractors how to replace who we were in the marketplace. And then, and then uh, this allows us some more time and effort to uh, take care of my brother. And this is a little video about Traumatic him. Traumatic brain injury is the most common cause of death in adults under age 45. A computer first developed to improve memory is now being tested on people recovering from brain injury. I thought I seven foot cabin cruiser came out while I was driving on the water. And I went right into the side of them. And I was paralyzed. That impact on a Texas lake two years ago crushed Ryan Reitmeyer's skull. His prognosis for survival? Grim. He was not recognizable. He had taken the full impact of, a, of an accident. I looked at the doctor, we looked at the CAT scan, and he said, um, I just said, can you save his life? The surgeon told Ryan's father, Doug, he thought he could save him, but warned Ryan would likely never speak again, never live independently. I said, do you go ahead and save his life? We'll take it from there. Because if anybody will prove you wrong, it'll be Ryan. 
Ryan spent two weeks in a coma, more than a month in the intensive care unit. So shortly thereafter, in 2010, we started uh, GC Experts and did our first uh, workshop. And uh, with that, what I'd like to do is introduce my father, Doug Reitmeyer. He's going to teach you guys the seven keys to federal construction profits. Uh, so come on, Dad. Hey, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just kind of run through this because uh, you want to know who is this guy. A little bit about me, I was known uh, secretly by the internal group of people that I worked with as the master of productivity. Every year I would get 30 to 40 federal contracts, completed more than a thousand of them, over a billion dollars in revenues, over 330 million dollars in profits, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers contracted the year awards twice. And uh, that was my life. So, you know, what happens with people, I'm sure it's happened a lot with you guys, you get successful at something and the success causes this dopamine to go in the brain. And it's like, you know, one of the guys described uh, what I taught him how to do. He says, I, I feel like I'm getting this heroin rush. You know, I want to keep doing it and doing it and doing it because uh, it, it just, it gets motivating. But... Um, as you get older, things change in your life. And when the accident happened to my son 10 years ago, we said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go do that anymore. I'm, I've got to take care of him. And then uh, when the economy took a nosedive and I read an article in the newspaper about how contractors were starving to death, and I knew that the federal market was, guys were just uh, crushing it. I mean, 50, 60, 70, 80% profit margins on federal contracts because Barack Obama had come in, he'd gotten Congress to give him approval to, to spend uh, $787 billion, of which $137 billion was slated for construction when there wasn't an infrastructure of contractors that had the bonding capability to go do those jobs. Uh, consequently, there was just massive profit going on. Well, 97% of the contractors were starving to death. 3% were making uh, unbelievable profits. Uh, so, you know, to give you an idea of, um, you know, where those numbers come from, I wrote an article that got published called Show Me the Money that explained that if you look at this trillion dollar construction market, what, what does that consist of? It consists of residential, commercial, industrial, city, county, state, and then federal. About 600 billion of that is everything except federal, about 300 billion is federal. So two thirds of the market is where you guys have been. And some of the people have told me in that market, because I don't know that market, I haven't been in that market for 40 years, is they feel sometimes they go after a job and it's like a pack of wolves going after a fawn or a baby rabbit. There's not enough food for everybody and extreme low profit margins. On the flip side, um, and, and the reason for that is you got about a million licensed contractors in the United States. Anybody venture to guess how many are registered and qualified to get federal contracts? It's less than 30,000, less than 3%. So uh, anybody in here registered to get federal contracts? I don't, anybody, okay? Um, so we have a breakout session tomorrow morning and, and the same session on Saturday will we'll get you registered and qualified in all 50 states and outlying territories on a national basis to get federal contracts. So what is government construction experts? Originally the concept was in my mind, if somebody would have come to me 25, 35, 40 years ago and said, Doug, do exactly what I tell you to do, write out a check for a million dollars, payable in five years and just do what I tell you to do, what would I teach that person? So I built companies that did over a hundred million, or nearly a hundred, not over, nearly a hundred million dollars a year. We did it in nine years, doubling every year in profits and revenues with federal contracts. 
So uh, if you really want to understand where we were coming from, it's like, what are we going to deliver that is going to change people's lives? So Government Construction Experts is a premium business training organization. We take construction businesses like yours, we transform them into becoming a national federal contractor. Why? Well, let's talk about why you guys aren't national federal contractors. You grew up much like I did coming into the business and you listened to other people tell you this is how it's done. Now, I didn't come from uh, any background or knowledge of the construction business and I'm probably not near as smart as a lot of people in this room. One thing I do know is if you've been successful in the construction business, that your brain is wired to a genius level. That means every one of you, if you've been successful in this construction business, you're already a genius. It's just that nobody's taken the genius you have and said, here's how to apply it in a market with unlimited opportunities. When we say unlimited opportunities, think about this. Uncle Sam owns and maintains more than 900,000 buildings. So that means if you're replacing a roof every 45 years, you've got 45,000 roofs to replace every year. Okay. Um, so what it really boils down to is the mindset that people get. So I'm going to talk a, a, just a moment here about the Swiss watchmakers. It should be up on a slide, right? Okay. If you go back throughout history, there were companies that were making watches up the, until the beginning of World War II. In the United States, we had Bulova, Hamilton, Timex. You had the German watch companies. You had the Italians. You had even Seiko over in Japan was started in 1908. Um, but what happened during World War II is uh, we stopped making a lot of watches in this country because of the huge war effort. We needed the metals. Uh, we, we literally made steel pennies so we, we could use the copper to make wires uh, in aircraft bombers, right? Um, so at the end of World War II, after we had decimated uh, Japan with nuclear bombs, Germany with millions of tons of bombs, and Italy with hundreds of thousands of tons of bombs, the Swiss found themselves where they had 90% of the world watch market, 90%. And over the next 10 years, they, they formed a consortium because they realized that Japan economy was starting to come back. We had sent Drucker over there. We sent the Marshall Plan over in Germany. Uh, the Italians were starting to rebuild their economy. And they were worried that, you know, here we got 50,000 people making watches. Uh, what's going to happen if these other companies come up? So they decided to form a consortium with their best manufacturers, and they would hire the smartest, most brilliant PhDs out of the universities to start teaching and, and, and training to advance the technology of watches so they could maintain this high level of control over the world watch market. And in fact, they were successful in doing so until about 1968. But something happened in 1968. There was an invention that by 1972, the Swiss had lost 90% of the world of what they controlled. In fact, it went from 90% down to 15%. Now, anybody here, do you know what invention came out in 1968 that by 1972 had decimated that Swiss control of 90% of the world watch market. In fact, they had 50,000 people in that business of manufacturing watches in, in, in Switzerland, um, and 35,000 of those people lost their jobs. Okay? What actually had happened was this, um, the invention of the quartz movement. The quartz movement was a thousand times more accurate than the watches we had prior to 1968. You, a little small battery, it lasts for five years. Didn't even need to wind it. The sad part of that particular story is that the Swiss actually invented it, that consortium. And they took it out to all their manufacturers and said, let me show you what we have here. And without exception, every one of them looked at it and said, uh, there, no, nobody's going to want that. Got to have a battery. We got watches now, you just shake like that, and they self-wind. 
And nobody needs something a thousand times more accurate. They looked at all the millions of dollars they had invested in all their employees. They said, what are we going to have all them, those people do if we, we start doing something different? And they didn't even patent it. At the World Watch Convention, they showed off their technology, the consortium group. And what happens when you invent something, you don't patent it, and you show it to the world? Well, Seiko picked up on it like that. The Japanese started making, what? Quartz time watches, movement watches. And then they got in with Seiko at you know, the Olympics and all these, uh, Omega. Um, these different companies started using their technology based on the quartz movement and they took over uh, uh, most of the market away from the Swiss. So it was just a mindset change. They had the technology in their hand, and what I'm going to expose to you, and the reason I'm telling you this story and a little bit about the railroad barons, is I want you to understand that it's a mindset change. Uh, what I teach people to do is to change their mindset, to open their eyes up to, hey, you guys already, you're already geniuses. You already understand the construction business, why not apply that in the area where the guy, that when he runs out of money, he just prints more, right? Think about that. He just prints more, right? Any of you, got, any of you have customers like that that just print their own money and they do it legally? Okay. Uh, our, our customer does that. The railroad barons. If you go back in history, uh, we had the Transcontinental Railroad about 1860. Um, by the late 1800s and early 1900s, the railroad barons were Cornelius Vanderbilt. His net worth was twice in today's dollars what Bill Gates is. Now think about that. The railroad baron was worth twice what Bill Gates was worth today in those dollars in. Yet by the 1930s, during the Depression, every single railroad went bankrupt. What happened between... 1900 and 1934 that caused the richest barons and their companies in the world, every single one of them, to go bankrupt. What was it? Competition. It was competition. Henry Ford started, and General Motors started making trucks. Our government started investing in highways. All of a sudden, whereas before the King Ranch down in Texas where they raised thousands of cattle, they had to hire cowboys, they had to fight Indians, they had to fight rustlers, they had to get that meat from Texas up to Kansas City where it could go on the railroad to New York, Chicago, Denver, San Francisco where the big meat markets were. But they, they were lucky if they could get 60 to 70 percent of that cattle up there. Cornelius Vanderbilt comes along and says, hey, just, we got these cars here, just load them up, send one guy up to collect the money. Was he selling his service on cost plus overhead and profit? Or was he selling it based on the value that he delivered? Think about that for a minute. Okay? When I got into the business, one of the stupidest things, when somebody told me that, hey, if you want to get in the construction business, let me tell you how you make money. You take your cost and you add overhead and profit. I went, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why would I ever want to sell based on cost plus overhead and profit, particularly if I could figure out how to get it done for half of what my competitors would have to pay for it, right? I'd just be giving that money away, right? So one of the things I want you to think about here is when those guys had all that money, the railroad barons had all that money in the 1900s, if they would have just switched their brain from we're in the railroad business to we're in the transportation of goods business, where would they have invested money? <laughs> Henry Ford, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, shipping, Onassis made all his money by putting super tankers out there, could have all been controlled. Airline industry, they were in the business of transporting goods. So they just had to shift, if they had just shifted from where the, in the railroad business to where in the transportation of goods business, do you see what a massive change that would have been? They still would be controlling a massive fortunes today. They don't. Okay. So it's, what we want to do is get you thinking about what's that shift look like? So in our world, when, what we do is we bring contractors in, and the first thing we tell them is, write this in your book. I am a national federal contractor. I perform construction services all over the United States, everything from wind tunnels, water treatment plants, kitchen renovations, roofing, replacements, and repairs. If there's federal money in it, I am interested. Think about that again. 
If there's federal money in it, I'm interested in it. Why? Because when I talk to contractors, and I was one of them before I became a federal contractor, I ask contractors, have you always been paid 100% of what people agreed to pay you when you were through? After you signed the contract, when you were through? Is there anybody here that can say, I've always been paid 100% of what people agreed to pay me? Guess what? I haven't had a single contractor in any of my classes, a hundred of them, tell me that they've always been paid 100%. Yet, I can tell you this, in the federal market, that person cannot get the contract off their desk until they pay you 100%. That was a huge game changer for me. When I knew I could get paid, because one guy went bankrupt on me, took me for 20 grand, I was a young guy, I went to the bank, I'd been doing a little federal contracting, I told the bank I need to borrow money, and I'm only gonna do federal contracts. And Bernie Beck said, well, why only federal contracts? I said, because they're the only people I know that when they run out of money, they just print more. He liked that, and he loaned me the money, and I went on to do a billion dollars in federal contracts. I'll give you an example of some of them, and the profit margins. This is Walter Reed Army Medical Center. There were two bidders on this, one for 1.550 million, was electrical contractor out of Washington, D.C. I bid 960,000. The government estimate was 620,000. My cost to perform the work was 308. Made 68% profit margin. Now, in the workshop, I actually will show you exactly how I did that, that massive profit margin. We did that in about 90 days. Um, when we showed the numbers on our financial statement to the bonding company, they actually asked if we were laundering drug money. Now, in all fairness, this happened when Marion Barry was the mayor of Washington, D.C., and he was... <laughs> part of the ab scam, he got busted for, uh, um, what was the, the drug they were using, some form of cocaine, but uh, <clears throat> um, I was called by Terry Brady at the FAA in Chicago. She asked me to come up there and negotiate a contract to install the first Doppler weather radar to measure wind shear. That's a photograph of it uh, actually taken from Google Earth um, up in Crestwood, Illinois. But look at the profit margin on that 90-day contract. I'll show you exactly how we do that stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll go through some of it tomorrow. Uh, inside, the, there was a movie came out. You may have seen it. It was kind of a kid's movie. It's called War Games. My wife were, and I were in bed one night watching this movie, War Games, and it was, uh, part of it was taken inside the Cheyenne Mountains. It was called NORAD. And I said to my wife, I said, would you like to go in there? And she said, well, we can't go in there. You know, that's top secret government place where they control the, the uh, defense of the whole United States and Canada. And I said, sure, we can go in there. All we got to do is bid a contract. And we did. And I took her in as my personal assistant. And uh, by the way, when you go inside the, that, if you have a contract in there like we did, um, they assign you an armed guard and the signs say, guards are authorized to use deadly force <clears throat> uh, this was the federal courthouse annex we built in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, that one was actually a year-long contract. Uh, this is a side view of it. Um, this one here was a real interesting contract because I bid the job to replace the cooling towers on top of the federal building in San Francisco. And what you see there is the actual, because um, this was taken years later with Google Earth photo because we didn't have drones and these funny tools that we have now. But um, I bid the job for 884000 and it was an invitation for bid. So the public knew that I had bid the job, but I was the only bidder. Now, at the time, I was real busy. I didn't hear anything from the government. And uh, 30 days later, they put the same thing out for bid. Now, I was a little upset about that because, you know, if you're the only bidder and the public knows that you're the only bidder and they know what your bid amount, except that I was real busy and I, doing a lot of government contracts, and so I just turned in another bid for 884000 Now, I didn't hear anything for another month, and it went out for bid again. Now I'm a little bit miffed, because so I was the only bidder twice, and now it's coming out for bid again. So I bid it for 884000 again. The next day, I got a phone call from GSA San Francisco, and they said, uh, hey, uh, we'd like to 
to talk to you about this job we've been. I said, yeah, three times. I said, uh, I said well, you know, what, what's, what's going on? She's, she said, well, you know, we know, see, yeah, you're the only bidder. Why do you think that is? And I said, well, probably because I'm the only guy that's crazy enough to think he can actually do the job. They said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, understand that if those big cooling towers were on the edge of the building, it'd be real easy. i just bring a 135-ton crane downtown San Francisco, just put it right up and set it over. But where these things are is way over on the building. This building is 19 stories tall, so there's no way of taking the crane and putting that over. The crane would just fall into the building, and there's no way of tying it off downtown there. And they said, well, how are you going to get them up there? I said, I have no idea, but if you give me $884,000, i will figure it out. <clears throat> and uh, so we did get the $884,000 contract. And basically, uh, wait, uh, it's a little bit more. And I said, what's the problem with the bid? And they said, well, it's way over the government estimate. I said, well, what's the government estimate? They said 650000 I laughed into the phone. I said, are you kidding me? I'm not in a, I'm going to hang up the phone now, okay? Because for 650000 you figure out how to get it up there, right? And uh, they, they went into a negotiation with me. And basically what I said is, you know, if you give me a can of anti-gravity spray and I can just spray on it and they float up there, and, or you guys bring some big, you know, b balloons or get the, make another Hindendorf or something and put it up there, I'll get it done for you for 650000 But otherwise, it's 884. But we made good money on the job. Uh, this was the federal b doing the same project. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys know this. What invention came out in 1981 that by 1985, all of these office buildings around the country had to have upgraded air conditioners? Anybody? What was invented in 1981 that every office building in America needed new air conditioning uh, upgrades five years later? The PC. Do you remember the old PC? What did you have that you were looking at? TV monitor, you put your hand over, it's like a little toaster, right? Yeah, a little computer. All these buildings had to have upgrades. We made a lot of money upgrading them. Uh, this is a uh, satellite view of the same building. Uh, if you've seen the new movie, Hidden Numbers, Hidden Numbers, the black mathematician uh, and helping our astronauts get into space, that's the building, 658. I had a $4.5 million renovation there. Look at the profit. That was a nine-month contract. Uh, replacing the water tower, Langley Air Force Base. That's a half a million gallon, 500,000 gallon water tank. We tore it down and put the new 300,000 gallon tank up. Uh, San Clemente Island. Um, I wish I had a little laser there I could show you, but uh, if you've ever heard of Bud's Camp, basic underwater demolitions, see all the Navy SEALs, SEAL Team 6. They all train right there in that little cove. It's called Bud's Camp. The top gun pilots from Miramar come out and do their touch and go landings right there on the, uh, that runway before they ever go out and land them on real aircraft carriers. The island is a big rock out in the Pacific Ocean, about 70 miles off the coast, a fun place to work, interesting. There's a road that goes from this end of the island to the other end, and when you're driving along the road, uh, there's this sign at the side of the road at a certain place that says, you are now entering the San Clemente Island National Forest. About 100 feet more, there's a bush about this tall, and then there's a sign saying, you are now leaving the San Clemente Island National Forest. <clears throat> Interesting place. Uh, rebuilt the power plant there, made over a million dollars profit on that. Uh, Protection River Naval Air Station. It was a $484,000 contract award. We used uh, the value engineering change proposal a cause of the contract to increase the profits by $70,000. So originally when I bid the job, we knew we'd make about 133, but using the VECP clause, which you see there, um, and, and put a, a different type of heater. Alcatraz, the uh, Indians took over that building when we abandoned the island uh, back in the 70s, and they really tore it up pretty bad, and then they abandoned the island, so then we went back out there and set it up as a tourist attraction. Building 64, which is the main visitor center there, uh, we made $141,000 profit replacing the roof on that building. Um, this is where the stealth fighters, uh, the home of the stealth fighters, is Holloman Air Force Base. You go into El Paso, Texas, it's about two miles uh, northwest, and you come into where this remote area 
uh, we renovated the officer club swimming pool. This is a job I, would, I knew I'd be the only bidder. And tomorrow, if you're in the, uh, the special class, I'm going to tell you how I, I'll give you five contracts, how I knew instantly I'd be the only bidder. Now, if you know you're going to be the only bidder, does your numbers go up or down? Uh, up, right? Okay. Well, so we're going to show you how that all works. Uh, this is why the uh, aperture door seal needed to be replaced. Um, this was the barracks complex out at uh, San Nicolas Island. There's seven channel islands off the coast of California. The Navy uh, operates two of them. And each one has its own unique species of fox that were left there by the Spaniards way back in the 1700s. But that's, uh, that's why I have the little picture of the fox there. Uh, that's the barracks complex we built. And uh, so national estimates suggest the contractors watching this are a segment of the 800,000 national contractors completing over 600 billion in volume and work. <clears throat> the number of federal contracts is public information. It's now a little bit more than that. This slide's a little old, but it's less than 30,000. So just think about those numbers. <clears throat> You're in a group of approximately 800,000 to a million licensed contractors in the United States competing for $600 billion worth of annual construction work. When you're in the federal market, you're in a group of less than 30,000, and if you start calling them, you'll find that less than 50% of them are active because how many contractors go out and they get registered and qualified to get federal contracts by getting a license, but then, oh, how do I actually get the contracts? Right? That's another story. So you can do the math, see where there's less competition, but there simply isn't enough bonding capacity among the 25,000 contractors to perform $300 billion worth of work. $47 billion of construction work in the United States that were issued solicitations by the federal government last year were never awarded. So the key number one is, first thing you have to do is get registered with the federal government. So that's your key number one. It's simple to do. It's free. It takes about 14 to 20 hours over a 10 to 2 week period. Uh, you just go to sam.gov. If you're in the class tomorrow, we're going to walk you step by step exactly what that process looks like and uh, make sure that you get registered. I even have a little ebook on it. <clears throat> so, you know, what do you have to do to get registered? You have to have a company. You already have that. If you, if you don't have one, these are the steps you have to go through to create it. Uh, do you get a federal ID number or a tax identification number? You will have to get a Dun & Bradstreet number. Uh, you'll have to get a resale certificate. Uh, this isn't absolutely necessary, but in certain states it comes in handy. You file with any necessary state taxing agency so you have a legitimate company. Open up a corporate or uh, money market account. Register at sam.gov. Complete a business plan, register on fbo.gov. Um, IdealSec has now been uh, um, abandoned, they don't use that. You will need general liability insurance. However, I tell people, don't spend money buying insurance till you get a federal contract and you know you can pay for it. Because you don't need to have it to bid a job. Number two, you find the jobs. Where do people find jobs? Well, the Army has their single face uh, um, to industry, there's the IdealSec, there's FedConnect.net. These are different places that you can find government solicitations. The big daddy is FBO.gov or FedBizOps.gov. And there's search functions on there down in the bottom right-hand corner of the page. There's some videos that will show you how, how to do it. Um, and then we have our own product uh, called BidTracker. How many federal agencies are there? Do you believe there's 496 currently? And the number, for some reason, keeps growing. And uh, we actually have a list of all of them, the list of major federal bureaucracies, pretty big. Uh, our product that I've put over a quarter million dollars in is uh, called Bid Tracker, and we use it exclusively for people that go through our training program. Uh, the reason for Bid Tracker is that I can tell in three seconds, three seconds, if I'm going to be low bid or not. Now, that, that may blow you away, but I spent a quarter million dollars building a system that, look, what's the single most valuable thing you have after your health? The most valuable thing you have after your health, I'm going to tell you right now, folks, it's time. 
If you want to write it down, the most important number in your life is the number 30,000. If you got a piece of paper, just take 30,000. That's the average number of days you're going to live from the time you're born to the time you pass away. And that's the time you have to create your legacy, that 30,000. Now, if you take that 30,000 days and you say, okay, well, the first 9,000 is growing up. That's from the time you were born until you go, okay, I've got a career and I'm going to start doing roofing restoration, whatever it is. For most people, that's about the first 9,000 days. Now, that's at the front end. Now, so we got 21,000 days left, right? Now, let's go to the back end. There's about 4,000 days where I think my son's going to say, Dad, I got it. Don't need you around, right? Not as sharp as you used to. Not making the right decisions. Maybe think about slowing down. Things aren't so important to, to do what I've been doing. And so you take that off. Now, what do you got? You're down to 17,000. Most of us don't want to work Saturdays, Sundays, weekends, holidays. So we take that part out. So we got five sevenths. Take out the holidays. You're down to about 12,000, right? My wife likes to tell me that when I go to the doctor now and you're filling out the little thing, there's these boxes there. I'm on the last box because I'm 67 years old, right? She's, Honey, you're on the last box, right? So when you put this in perspective, I'm telling you, the time is critical. So I spent a lot of money figuring out how to reduce the time that I would spend finding highly profitable government contracts. Now, I used to say and think, and I was taught, there's only two numbers. There's only two numbers in this business. The first number is what you can get a contract for, and you want that to be as high as you can possibly get it. What's the other number? What is going to cost you to get it done? We're in it for the spread. Can we all agree? We're in it for the spread. We want that spread to be as big as possible. But the factor that you miss in that, that I teach is, wait a minute, there's three numbers. There's what you're going to get a contract for, what it's going to cost you, how much time is it going to take? Because most people in the construction business will trade their time for twenty to two hundred dollars an hour. Any one of you, if I come and say, "Look, I got a great project here. It's paying one hundred and fifty bucks an hour. Week. Can I get your time for two weeks?" Most people will go, "Hey, I'm in, right?" But yet there are people in the construction business making a thousand to ten thousand even more per hour. Think about that: ten thousand dollars an hour, thirty thousand dollars an hour. I actually teach how to do this. I got lots of guys that have made. I, a, a job he just did with Marcus, he made $18,000 an hour. Took one hour's time, he got a number in, we negotiated with the government, and then I turned right around, $149,500 to remove a heat treatment furnace at the shipyard in Philadelphia. Marcus is in Washington, and then I got Jimmy Johnson, you can write it down, Tamco Demolition, you can Google it, you can call Jimmy, say, hey, did you take that heat treatment furnace out for $71,000? Because when I got all through, Think about that. So we had a contract for 149.5. Jimmy took care of all of it in seven days for 71, and he made $50,000 on it. Right? Um, so that's our software. This is what our front end looks like, and, and these special reports. These reports are made to read right from left, but in three seconds, once I teach you how to do it, you can go through and see everything the government's doing on any day in the future, and in three seconds, you can put together what I'd say, look, here's the criteria, here's how you'll know that you'll be the only bidder on these projects. Key number three is federal set-asides. Somebody uh, I met out there said they were in 8A, they hadn't been using it, and I said, if you come to the, uh, the breakout session tomorrow, I'll walk you through how the, uh, I took one 8A contractor, and in one year, Joe Call from Buffalo, New York, Call Associates, that's C-A-L-L, -L, he made $1.1 million in one year with 8A certification set aside contracts doing federal work after he'd been through our workshop. Uh, the SBA's got a tremendous website, a lot of information on there. If you're a minority and you can get uh, 8A status, I highly recommend it. There's a hub zone program, sba.gov, sba.gov forward slash hub zone. Find out if you're in the hub zone. There's hub zone set aside contracts. Key number four is go from a local contractor to a national one. Take your eyes off of I'm a roofing contractor and I'm looking for another roofing contract to... The way I teach it is, hey, you can write it down on a piece of paper. Problems equal opportunity. 
problems equal opportunity. If you write that down, put the word big over each side. Big problems equal big opportunities. Now, see, in our world, you're dealing with the insurance guy and jester and all these other people, then they're pretty savvy people. In the government world, the facilities manager is asking for the money. The guy that needed the cooling towers replaced, the old wooden cooling towers up on top of that federal building, he said, man, I, you know, these are all rotted out. We've got to replace it. What's modern? We want to have stainless steel. We want to have PVC inserts. We don't want wood that rots out. So he goes to, up the chain of command, goes to Congress, goes to the president, puts a, a budget together and says, okay, we get the money down here. Now, do we, the federal government, give that facility manager, here's 884000 go pay Doug to do it? Or do we make him, because what are we training him to do? We, the taxpayers. We're paying that guy to run the building, not, not to spend money. So he has to go over to a contract administrator who is trained to protect our dollars. And that person's tasked with find a contractor that'll do it. What does he or she do? They advertise it on Fed Biz Ops, okay? And we'll show you lots of keys on, on, on how that works and, and how, how you can use that to your advantage once you understand how that, that system works. But the important thing to understand is electrical work in Texas uses the same conduit, the same wires, electrical work in Washington or, or Florida. Um, plumbing works the same, same copper, same fittings, same uh, flux. I mean, everything's the same. If you look at roofing work in Texas, the materials, roofing work in Washington, roofing work in, in Florida, it's all the same. When you're dealing with the government, the key number five is clarity. Make it real clear. If you want that off your desk, we're the people to do it. And so when you're going through and you're filling out these forms, you got to put the information there. Your past performance documentation, you give them the, all the right stuff so there's no reason why they shouldn't award you the contract. If there's a mandatory site visit, we'll walk you through how to do that at no cost to you anywhere in the country. Very simple way of doing that. Know the job, know the job site. So what's the different tools you can use? You can look on Skype, you can look on YouTube, you can use email, LinkedIn. I, I've had some of my guys, I just go on LinkedIn, find out, because I could sort by zip code and find somebody that was in that trade. Say, look, I'm looking at a project over in your backyard. Would you like to go out and take a look at it for me? And let's see if we can't make this thing work. Google Earth. Um, you know, I, I, I've used Google Earth numerous times to look at these federal projects to understand what, what condition that I was getting into. Getting paid under the Prompt Payment Act, you get paid in 14 days on um, progress payments. So every month they'll pay you. So this isn't something where the guys told me in the insurance, you mean you get paid in 14 days, how's that? You know, they wait months sometimes. Um, and then we show you how to accumulate references from the government. These are just samples of letters that I received from government agencies. Uh, what's the process I would use? I'd write them a nice letter. I used to fax it to them, now I email it to them. I call and ask if they like it or if it needs to be revised, I tell, call it a draft. I mail an original along with examples and I get the reference. One guy said, well, I've asked the government forever. They told me that they don't do that. And I said, why'd you ask? What you do is you write one first, ask them, hey, did I, is this okay if I mail this to you? And then when you mail it, you send, or, or you email it, you send it with a bunch of other letters, even if you send mine. Hey, a buddy of mine, got these real nice letters from the agency. You see how it's really hard for them to say we don't do that when they're sitting there looking at agency letters where they've already done it, right? That's how I accumulated a lot of references. Uh, PPIRS, I, I did a little video on this. You, if you go to YouTube and you put PPIRS uh, in YouTube, that, that little video will come up. Um, if you want to see what it is, it stands for Past Performance Information Retrieval System. It's PPIRS.gov. PPIRS.gov, and that's where the government has a repository of your past performance. Um, this was a, another project I knew would be the only bidder. This is the Abraham Lincoln home in Springfield, Illinois, and that's a wheelchair lift. They actually had three of them, and they needed them replaced. They were put in in 1983, excuse me, 1993, and uh, in 2009 they needed a replacement and uh, we'll walk you through exactly how I knew I was going to be the only bidder. 
And to give you the, what the, so I had an $87,400 contract award. I paid Hercules to build them for me for $30,000. I paid Portable Mobility $2,000 a piece to put them in. You do the math. I mean, you know, these, these are high profit jobs. And I did this all from sitting in my office. <clears throat> uh, th these are real numbers, real jobs. I, I showed you the Scotia, New York, the uh, aircraft. Um, Aperture door seal on the aircraft hangar door that needed to be replaced. Here's the real numbers. I bought the, uh, um, I, the manufacturer was a company called Bond Seal. Jerry was the national sales manager. And I said, who's the number one guy in the United States that does this work? After I got the contract for 87, no, I bid the job for 87,300. The government said your price is too high. And so we negotiated it using what we call the $100,000 letter for $82,273. But I paid Dan's Doors. You can actually go to the website, dansdoors.com. You can call Dan right off there and say, you know this guy, Doug Reitmeyer? You did some job for him in Scotia, New York? It was a $34,750 contract. But he did all the work. First offered this, it was $10,000 a ticket. The reason <laughs> that it was 9997 was that PayPal wouldn't let you charge anything over $10,000. I was, I told my son, you know, look, I'm not going to let anybody, I'm going to teach this stuff to anybody unless they're giving me 25 grand, because I, I put, you know, my whole life into this thing. And uh, he, he said, no, you got to keep it at 10,000. You want to know anything at all about federal contracting? I'll tell you this, when you walk in the door, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. One is, you're never going to have a problem on a federal contract I haven't already had, and I have a brilliant solution for. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call me. So if you're suffering on some problem you're having on a federal contract, you own it until you pick up the phone. You call me, usually in seconds, I'll say, here's what we're going to do, and we'll get this taken care of. Yes, uh, let's see, we have a microphone over here. Somebody, so raise your hand, and it'll get a microphone, and so we can all get everybody on the same page. So we're having a problem. My mic's not on. There we go. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, my name's Dave. I was just, I want to know how you got the water cooling system but, 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 How did you get the... How, how did I put the cooling towers up in the roof? I did it with a helicopter. Um, we, there, was a, there was one helicopter in the San Francisco Bay Area that had twin engines but single rotor and it was small enough and powerful enough that we could do it in two sections. So literally what we did is on, on, we took one side of the cooling tower uh, of the building and we took all of the, the wood down and we palletized it. So we carried pallets up to the roof. We palletized it and strapped it. We had trucks come in. We, they, they let us take one side. I wish I had that. that, that it, basically, that building takes up a whole city block. So they had one side of the building that we could block off. We brought the trucks in from Evapco with the cooling tower sections. When that helicopter came in, because of the weight, it would only hold four and a half minutes of fuel. So we had a, a fueling truck there. So the first thing the helicopter came in was he had gauged how much fuel he had, and he picked up a pallet, and he put it down on the ground, and then picked up a cooling tower section, took it back up, and then went back down, refueled it. Not, not completely full, but enough fuel, because weight's a real big deal. I mean, the fuel weighs, and then we had the weight of the, the cooling tower sections. But uh, every four, <laughs> four minutes, we had a, a cooling tower section come out, another one going up, and then bring the pallets of wood down. So we did that over one weekend. Um, kind of a funny thing, we, were, we stayed over a weekend there, and Bob Smichael, my controls guy, who was working with me on the job, and we decided to stay over in San Francisco. We went down to, to Chinatown. I tell the story on myself because it was, he, he laughed his ass off. And I think he died of laughter um, eventually over this one incident. We get into Chinatown. It was a warm summer day. We'd been working all week at Saturday. And we went into a China shop. And I was thinking, you know, I'd get one of those Chinese fans. And so I said to the guy behind the, the counter, I said, you know, do you have a Chinese fan? And he reached around. He went to grab one. And he says, dollar. And I'm thinking to myself, a dollar? Now, keep in mind, this was back a number of years ago. It was really like 2 or $3 today. And I'm thinking, you know, they got a lot of cheap stuff in Chinatown. All I, I'm just going to throw it away anyway. And I said, you got anything cheaper? And he pointed behind me. He said, 25-cent Chinese man. Now, I don't know if you 
remember you had sparklers on 4th of July, what those boxes looked like? Well, it was a box that looked like, I, I thought it was sparklers at first, but I pick it up and inside was a Chinese fan. So I gave him 28 cents with the tax and we walked out. I opened this thing up and I start going like this. And as I started doing it, it was like it was made out of toothpicks and toilet paper. I mean, it literally fell apart in my hand. I'm sitting there with toothpicks and toilet paper in my hand. And Bob's just laughing his ass off at me, buying a cheap Chinese fan. But now I'm a little bit upset because this guy sold me a cheap Chinese fan that wouldn't work for what I wanted it to do. So we walk back in and he's like, and I said, hey, the little Chinese guy look up at me and he goes, how you use? I go, what? He goes, how you use? I go, well, I opened the box up and I went like this and it just fell apart. And he goes, 25 cent Chinese fan? No, he said, dollar Chinese fan. He says, 25 cent Chinese fan? <laughs> anyway, so we, we, we had some fun times over the years. All right, any other questions? We, we need a microphone over here? Anybody? Yeah, anybody? Okay. Anybody? Okay. Is there any reason anybody here thinks they could not do what I do? Because I'm telling you, it took me five years to get through high school. Okay? I, and I was shocked that... Now, I know I didn't go to half the classes my first senior year, but I was shocked that I didn't graduate. Duh. Ended up going to a military academy so I could graduate. I was a college dropout. I was a drafted during the Vietnam War. Okay, there's nothing special about me. I didn't grow up in the construction business. But one thing I did do is whenever I had a problem, I analyzed the hell out of it. And I said, how can I make sure I never have this problem again? And how can I take the lemons I got here and turn them into lemonade? And I did that year after year after year until there's nobody. You go to today, and, and not because I'm some SEO expert, but you can go to Google and type in federal construction expert. It'll be real easy to find out who number one is. I have no idea how you'd find number two.
Okay, you can do the math. Okay, what happens now? Taking ownership is a process. It takes time, reinforcement, competent help. Most people can't do it without ongoing support, and that's why we have an introduction to the Federal Construction Workshop. Um, we have a limited number of uh, events that we're going to do over the next couple months. You can actually find Austin. Uh, what does it look like? I mean, you're, it's live, me on stage, and we, we get right down to it. Small classes, small groups. Uh, we get into it. We don't let you leave there until you feel like, okay, I'm a racehorse. Just open the gate. I'm ready to go get federal contracts. This is what the, the training room looks like um, that we were training in at the hotel. We've since built our own.